Hi there, and welcome to PhD at Living. Today continues our rabbit hole discussion on processed cheese, and in this episode, we actually start talking about processed cheese. Listen, if you want a shallow two-minute explanation that makes you feel like you learned something but you actually didn't, feel free to just scroll on up to the more popular videos on YouTube. How does processed cheese differ from regular cheese, and why doesn't processed cheese melt in the microwave? Here's an amazing secret. By its proper legal definition, and how's that for a hedged bet, American cheese is actually real cheese. It's not legally called American cheese. No, oh, that's pasteurized processed cheese to you, buddy. But it is based on the American cheese invented by Canadian, yeah, I see the irony there, James Kraft in 1916. In U.S. Patent 1186524, process of sterilizing cheese and an improved product produced by such process, one of the least original names of all time, Kraft describes the problem. It's a well-known fact that cheese of the cheddar genus cannot be heated to a temperature much above its melting point without disintegrating and permanently losing its true cheesy character. That is to say, the melted cheese becomes stringy and the casein and fat separate and cannot be returned to their original combined true cheese form and homogenous condition. For this reason, it's been impossible to treat such cheese to a high sterilizing temperature without spoiling it. And a completely sterilized and permanently keeping cheese of the cheddar genus has not been produced prior to my discovery. Kraft's invention was basically to heat cheese to 175 degrees Fahrenheit with continuous stirring, and that sterilized the cheese while also keeping the fats and the caseins from separating. You'll note in the patent that Kraft says you take a full block of cheese and cut it into small pieces for this process, but one could be convinced that this process was designed for those little nubbins at the end of a cheese block you just didn't have anything else to do with. Happy coincidence, I suppose. And that's part one of the processed cheese process. Pasteurization. While that gets you most of the way there, the next step is real chemistry magic. I'm talking, of course, about emulsification. It turns out Kraft wasn't the first person to use pasteurization to improve cheese shelf life. No, that was Swiss scientist Walter Gerber and Fritz Stettler in July 1913. Before that, the head of the Swiss National Dairy and Bacteriological Institute, Robert Burry, discovered in 1912 that adding cheese scraps and sodium citrate at elevated temperature created a shelf-stable cheese that was also smooth like butter. The literature isn't particularly forthcoming as to whether Burry, Gerber, or Stettler knew why the sodium citrate worked, just that it worked. In the U.S., this process was patented by Phoenix cheese scientist George Garston in 1921. In his U.S. patent 1368624, Garston used sodium phosphate as the emulsifier. By now, even an idiot should have at least some idea what an emulsifier does, but let's bludgeon it to death in typical PhD of living fashion, huh? Great! An emulsifier is a substance that stabilizes an emulsion. Load of damn good that definition did, huh? An emulsion is pretty much the same thing as a colloid. It's a mixture of two immiscible materials that, for whatever reason, are not. The big difference is a colloid is a mixture of a liquid and a solid, while an emulsion is a mixture of two liquids. So think something like oil and water here. A lot of edible systems, such as mayonnaise and hollandaise, are emulsions, but I digress. In processed cheese, the goal is to keep the fat globules and the protein globules happily comminuted, the fancy patent word for together. To do that, an emulsifying salt is used. Typically, an emulsifying salt has a monovalent cation and a polyvalent anion. Let's make that concrete and just say that your emulsifying salt is going to be something like sodium, monovalent, one charge, cation, positive, phosphate, PO4, three minus, polyvalent, three, anion, minus. So far, so good. First, because that phosphate anion is the conjugate base of hydrogen phosphate, there is some very, very weak pH modulating stuff going on here. However, the main purpose of the emulsifying salt appears to be snatching up calcium ions and casein complexes. Let's talk about that. The emulsifier sequesters calcium ions and breaks down the molecular forces that crosslink monomers in the greater casein protein network. Breaking that down, I've basically shown the casein here as being composed of a bunch of smaller monomeric protein pieces. That's also as artistic as I get. Combining that calcium sequestration by the emulsifying salt with something like heat and stirring during a process of, oh, I don't know, something like pasteurization, and you break down that greater casein structure into hydrated and dispersed smaller protein pieces, like these. Those hydrated and dispersed smaller protein pieces can then coat the fat globules and make them more stable in the cheese protein matrix, hence emulsification. Hang on here. 
You said emulsions were liquid liquid and colloids were liquid solid, but you're telling me these fat globules and protein thingies are liquids right now? You're right. Milk is technically an emulsion of solids and liquids, but it's also a colloid. It turns out emulsions are a type of colloid, but not all colloids are emulsions. This video would be three times as long if you wanted to get into it, and I don't, so we're just going to move on. I'll also mention that most emulsifiers happen to have hydrophilic and hydrophobic groups. Sodium citrate, our example emulsifier, is obviously polar by virtue of it being an ionic compound, and also the phosphate anion as a pretty big dipole. So what gives? Well, it turns out in cheese, the protein is the one that actually does the emulsifying. It has the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic groups, if you remember back to our amino acid functional group discussions, and the emulsifying salt really just sort of activates the protein to do its emulsifying thing. So there. Which brings us back to processed cheese. Initially, the goal of processed cheese was to make it more shelf stable and find a way to make the scraps more marketable. However, in a happy symbiosis, the processing conditions for pasteurization were basically the perfect avenue for introducing the emulsifiers. And the emulsifiers kept the fats and the proteins together at the higher pasteurization temperatures. All this leads to the wonders of processed cheese and how beautifully ooey gooey melty it is. But not all processed cheese is equivalent. Remember how I said there were legal definitions for cheese in the United States? Yeah, now that becomes real important. Here's something that's going to come as a shock to you. Food companies want stuff to look real and taste real, but also be made with as much cheap trash as possible. For that reason, the processed cheese world is rife with imposters. The FDA, as far as what I can tell on 21 CFR 133, really only has two big definitions for our purposes in this video. Pasteurized processed cheese and pasteurized processed cheese food. There are a bunch of other minor definitions like pasteurized blended cheese and pasteurized processed cheese spread with or without nuts and fruit and stuff, but just to keep it simple, we're going to stick with these two. Pasteurized processed cheese is about as pure a processed cheese as you get. It has at least one legally defined cheese in it, is pasteurized at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 30 seconds, has an emulsifying agent in it, and only has certain additives added in final assembly. Pasteurized processed cheese has a maximum moisture content of 43% and a minimum fat content of 47%. Pasteurized processed cheese food is pretty similar but has more additives in it, so the regulations are loosened a bit. Max moisture content is 44% and minimum fat is a meager 23%. Oh, by the way, pasteurized processed cheese food has to have at least 51% actual cheese in it. You can see where we're headed if we have to define how much cheese is actually in your damn cheese. If a product is going to be one of these two things, it has to have this phrase verbatim exactly like this on the label. If your product does not have one of these two things on it, again, exactly verbatim, anything added, anything missing, is actually unregulated detritus. And your guess is as good as mine, what the hell's in it. I'm not saying just because it has a bunch of fake crap in it that it's harmful or dangerous or it's not healthy or perfectly nutritious for you, but I am definitely saying it isn't real cheese. And now, after two full videos of food chemistry, we've arrived at why some processed cheese slices have a hard time melting in the microwave or in an open flame. The particular cheese slices my buddy was asking me about were imitation pasteurized processed cheese food. You see how deceptive that is? They take the four words that do have a legally defined composition and then just put imitation in the front and then don't have to legally abide by any of them. Long story short, this is not cheese. The first ingredient is whey. What? Yeah, turns out you can make cheese-like stuff from whey, but it can't legally be called cheese because it doesn't come from the curd. Ricotta cheese, for instance, is made almost exclusively from whey, but that's not the point. No, the point is that after our way, we get into the real fun stuff. Interesterified soybean oil, modified food starch, water, salt, and less than 2% of a bunch of emulsifiers, additives, preservatives, and other. So that likely answers why our fake cheese slices have a hard time melting in the microwave. They're not real cheese. Sure, they've got water and an emulsifier in them, but that's basically where the similarities to real processed cheese stop. But that's not the whole story either. You'll also see videos online of real cheese not melting in an open flame and have claims of some other global conspiracy. But here's what's happening there. Spoiler alert, a little bit of science here. It turns out an open flame is a different heating environment than a saucepan on your stove on medium low. 
Your cheese in the open flame is likely melting. It's just moving so quickly into the burnt, charred, blackenedness stuff phase that you don't really see the melting of it. If you put your cheese slice on your saucepan on wicked high heat, it probably would do the same thing. In total summary, cheese is made from milk. The milk is separated into curds and whey. The curds are colloidal fat and proteins that are chemically altered to make them fully in suspension instead of colloidal. After separation, the cheese is physically processed to drain the whey and make the cheese into its final composition. Processed cheese is real, honest cheese that's pasteurized to make it more shelf-stable and has emulsifiers added to make sure that those fats and proteins in the processed cheese stay together during that all-critical melting phase. The processed cheese world is rife with many, many imposters, so make for darn sure you're buying actual processed cheese instead of vegetable oil with some yellow food coloring added. And that, friends, brings our two-episode discussion on cheese to a close. See you next time. It's the Leaning Tower of Cheese.